Chapter 13 of The Man with the Black Feather This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by a fine voice. The Man with the Black Feather by Gaston Leroux, translated by Edgar Jepson. Chapter 13. The Cure That Missed At hearing that he was at the house of Monsieur Eliphas de saint anne de Telebourg de la Nox, Theophrastus was somewhat reassured, for he had heard both Marceline and Adolphe speak of him with reverence as a leading member of the Pneumatic Club. Theophrastus had chanced to hear of the Pneumatic Club, and he had caused Marceline to become a member of it. He was at the time too busy to join it himself, under the impression that it was the chief social club of the most prominent people in the rubber industry. But of course everybody knows that pneumatology is that part of metaphysics which deals with the soul. In Greek, pneuma and the pneumatics are those versed in this science, which has nothing whatever to do with the elastic and resilient substance extracted by incision from a tree, which was named by the benighted savages who discovered it, the Kaushuk. Marceline did not trouble the busy Theophrastus with her discovery that the pneumatic club was a branch of spiritualism and not of the rubber industry. She contented herself with inviting Monsieur Adolphe Lacamas to join it also, and both of them became devout admirers and disciples of that great expert in the occult, Monsieur Eliphas de saint elme de Telbourg de la Nox. It is no wonder that, on learning from Marceline of the painful affair of the ears of Signor Petito, Monsieur Lacamas should have urged instant recourse to that great expert to learn the proper methods of dealing with a reincarnate soul of such unfortunate antecedents. Adolf looked at Theophrastus with deep commiseration in his eyes, as if his conversation with the mage had given him reason for dismay. Come along, Marceline is here, and we are going to introduce you to a good friend, he said somberly. He led the way down the corridor, opened a door, and ushered Theophrastus into a large dim room. At once his eyes were attracted by a marvellous light, which fell on the noblest, gentlest, and most beautiful face of a man he had ever seen. The light was marvellous because that striking figure did not seem to receive it, but to diffuse it. When it moved, the light moved with it. It was a figure and a torch. Before this torch knelt Marceline, her hands joined as if in supplication, and on her fell some of the rays from this gracious, almost divine figure. Then Theophrastus heard a friendly voice, a male voice, but sweeter far than the voice of any woman, which said, Come to me without fear. Theophrastus still gazed in wonder at the kind of astral light which was diffused from the figure of the mage, the light which the painter James Tiso has succeeded in reproducing, in an engraving of great beauty from a photograph of a mediumistic apparition communicated to the Congress of Spiritualists of 1910 by Dr. McNabb. In this drawing, beside the materialised figure of a young girl, stands Monsieur Eliphas de saint elme de Telbourg de la Nox and his light. Theophrastus gazed silently upon the radiant visage of Monsieur Eliphas de la Nox. It would be unfair on the ink of the printer to give him his full name every time I mention him. Then, since he felt a sudden strong sympathy with this radiant being, into whose presence he had been so suddenly introduced, in spite of having found him in a frame he thought almost diabolic, he plucked up courage and resolved to learn the meaning of all the strange things he had seen. "'I don't know where I am,' he said somewhat plaintively, "'but since I see my friend Adolf and my wife Marceline with you, I feel reassured. I should like very much to know your name. My friend, I am called... Eliphas de saint elme de Telbourg de la Nox. You're really called all that, said Theophrastus, who was beginning to recover his spirits. The radiant being bowed his head gravely. Well, after all, there's nothing very astonishing in that, said Theophrastus. My name, my real name, my actual family name is Cartouche, and for a long time everybody has believed that it was a nickname. Your name is not Cartouche. It is Theophrastus Longway, said Monsieur Eliphas de la Nox, with gentle firmness. 
the one does not prevent the other said theophrastus who better than any one else knew what he was talking about quite logically i beg your pardon said m eliphas de la nox with the same gentle firmness you must not cherish this confusion of mind once upon a time your name was cartouche but now it is theophrastus longway understand that you are theophrastus longway my friend listen to me carefully as you would listen to a physician who is going to heal you for you are ill my friend very ill exactly because you believe you are cartouche when you are really theophrastus longway i appeal to all the simplicity of your soul that's all right said theophrastus i like simple things myself so i dislike very much very much indeed the way by which one comes to see you through a labyrinth of passages with skeletons hanging up in them what's he doing in your house by the way that skeleton instead of resting quietly on saint chamon hill i recognized him at once they were dragging him to the charnel house at the gallows of montfaucon the very day of my marriage with my dear wife marie antoinette neron when we were having our wedding breakfast at the chopinettes beaulieu and old easy-going were with us at that epoch my dear monsieur eliphas de telpot eliphas de telbourg corrected adolphe in a somewhat shocked tone at that epoch my friend adolphe who's as serious as a donkey will tell you so they no longer hung people at the gallows of montfaucon but they used to throw into the charnel house of those gallows the remains of people whom they hung elsewhere that's how it was that this poor gastelard whose skeleton i recognized just now was dragged to the charnel house after having been hung in the place de greve gastelard my dear monsieur saint elmo's fire de saint elme monsieur lacamus corrected him again my dear monsieur de saint elme gastelard wasn't up to much a poor beggar full of imagination who having one day disguised himself as a king's deputy demanded his sword from a gentleman showing him at the same time an order of committal the gentleman believed that he was being duly arrested and handed over his sword the hilt of which was gold and the most beautiful you ever saw the story ended with gastelard at the end of a rope but i'll be hanged my dear monsieur de la equinox de la nox insisted adolphe de la nose my dear monsieur de la nose i'll be hanged if i ever expected that i should one day find his skeleton in a house in houchette street the mage motionless and silent regarded theophrastus and his talk with an attention nothing could divert i have never laughed anywhere so much as at saint chamon hill between chopinet's mill and cock mill said theophrastus with the same garrulous cheerfulness chopinet's tavern was there it had taken the place of the tavern francois villon was so fond of where for centuries all the cullies and doxes of paris used to come on hanging days to carouse it was between chopinet's mill cock mill and the gallows of montfaucon that i buried my treasures and if you have a plan of old paris my dear monsieur elephant de tailpot de saint elmo's fire de la nose theophrastus had not quite come to the end of his host's name when of a sudden the darkness fled and the room and all in it shone clear in the brilliant light of day he looked round him with manifest satisfaction at his wife who was muttering a prayer at his friend adolf who was on the verge of tears at the bookshelves which practically walled the room and at Monsieur Eliphas de Lanox, who smiled at him with gentle compassion. The mage had lost his supernatural air, his cloak of astral light had gone, and if his features had still their sublime and ineffable pallor, he none the less looked a man like anybody else. "'I like this a good deal better,' said Theophrastus, with a deep sigh of relief. The mage raised his hand. "'No, I will not give you a map of old Paris to look at.' though i have them of every age he said you have nothing to do with old paris you are theophrastus longway and we are in the year nineteen eleven that's all very well but it's a question of my treasure treasures which belong to me said theophrastus stubbornly and i have every right to look in a map of old paris at the place where i formerly buried my treasures in order that i may see on a map of new paris where i shall have to hunt again 
It's clear. The mage interrupted him, saying to Monsieur Lacamus, I've often seen here crises of karma, but it has never been my privilege to study one of such force. Oh, but so far you've seen nothing, nothing at all, cried Theophrastus. The mage reflected a moment. Then he took Theophrastus to a map of the Paris of today, which hung on the wall of this great library, and pointed out to him the exact spot on which had stood Chopinette's mill, Cock Mill, and the gallows of Montfaucon. Then he laid his finger in the middle of the triangle they formed, and said, Here is where you must hunt, my friend, to recover your treasures. But all this quarter has been altered again and again, and I very much doubt whether your treasures will still be found where you buried them. I have shown you the spot on a modern map to clear your mind of the matter. For, my friend, you must clear your mind. You must not dwell on your treasures. You must not live in the past. It is a crime. You must live in the present. That is to say, for the future. My friend, you must drive out Cartouche, because Cartouche is no more. It is Theophrastus Longway who is. The mage pronounced these words in a tone of the most solemn earnestness. Theophrastus smiled at him sadly and said, I am very much obliged to you for your interest in me, and I will not hide from you the fact that I find you extremely sympathetic. In spite of your skeletons and the odd words which crawl about your walls, you must be very learned indeed to judge from all these shelves full of books, and you must be very good-hearted, for you have certainly treated me with the greatest kindness. But I tell you, and sorry I am to say it, that you can do nothing for me. For unfortunately, my dear sir, you think that I'm ill, but I'm not ill at all. If I were ill, I've no doubt that you'd cure me. One doesn't cure a man who's not ill. You say to me you must drive out Cartouche. It's a grand thing to say. Splendid. But I don't believe it, my dear Monsieur Elephant de Brandebourg de saint Elmo's fire de la box. But the mage took his hand and said with unchanged kindliness, Nonetheless, Cartouche must be driven out, for if we do not succeed in driving him out, we shall have to kill him. And I will not conceal from you, my dear Monsieur Longway, the fact that that is an exceedingly difficult operation. When the man of light, says Theophrastus in his memoirs, undertook to relieve me of this obsession by Cartouche, which was not, alas, a matter of imagination but a very real thing, I could only smile pitifully at his vast conceit. But when I understood that he proposed to drive him out by the sole miracle of the reason, I thought it was time to serve the mage up hot at Charenton Lunatic Asylum. But presently, when he had explained the matter more fully to me, and I began to understand his theory and method, I found myself in full agreement with him, and ready to serve his purpose of driving Cartouche out of me by the sole miracle of the reason. Indeed, I came in the end to appreciate the vast abyss which separated the man of light from my friend Adolf, the vast abyss which will always separate the man of reason from the learned ape. First of all, he assured me that I had been Cartouche. He was assured of it, and furthermore, it was the most natural thing in the world. He said he had scolded Adolf, having presented my case to him as exceptional, when my case was the case of everybody. Of course, Everybody has not been Cartouche, but everybody has been, before their existence of today, a good many other people, among whom may very well have been found persons every whit as bad as Cartouche. You understand the man of light. Mine was an everyday case. Everybody has lived before living, and will live again. He told me that it was the law of karma. One is being born all the time. One never dies and when one dies, it is that one is being born again, and so on, from the beginning of beginnings. It is understood that at each birth the personality differs from the preceding and succeeding personalities, but each is only a modification of the divine and spiritual ego. These different personalities are, in a way, only the rings in the infinite chain of life which constitutes throughout the ages our immortal individuality. And then the man of light told me that when one has grasped this immense truth, one should not be astonished that some of the events of today recall some of the events of long ago. But in order to live according to the law of wisdom, one should live in the present and never look backward. 
I had looked backward too much. My spirit, badly guided by Monsieur Lacamas, had during the last few weeks been wholly occupied with the long ago, and undoubtedly if that had gone on, I should soon have been reduced to a state dangerously near to that of madness. I ought to be no more astonished at having had another state of soul two hundred years ago than I ought to be astonished at having had another state of soul twenty years ago. Was it that the Theophrastus of today had any connection with the Theophrastus of twenty years ago? Certainly not. The Theophrastus of today ignored that young man. He even disapproved of him. Would it not be stupid indeed to devote all my faculties to reviving the Theophrastus of twenty years ago? Therefore the great mistake I had made had been only to live for Cartouche, because I had chanced to remember that I had once been Cartouche. I tell you that I found the words of Monsieur Elephant de la Box indeed refreshing. They did me a world of good. He also told me other things which I shall remember if I live to be a thousand years old. He told me that what are called vocations in the men of today are only latent revelations of their past lives, that what is called facility is only a retrospective sympathy for objects with which they are better acquainted than with anything else because they made a more careful study of them before this actual life, and that is the only explanation of it. Thereupon he pressed me to his bosom as a father embraces his child. He breathed upon my eyes and brow his healing breath, and he asked me if I was now persuaded of this truth, and realised that to live happily it was necessary to bear in mind our condition of perpetual change, and that by doing so we should learn to live in the present and to understand that the whole of time belonged to us. I wept with joy, and my dear wife wept with joy, and Adolf wept with joy. I assured the man of light that I understood and believed that I was no longer astonished that I had been Cartouche, though I was somewhat distressed by the fact, but that it was, after all, so natural that I should never again give it a moment's thought. I cried, Be at ease! Let us all be at ease! Let us live in the present! Cartouche is driven out. Thereupon Marceline asked what time it was, and Adolf answered that it was eleven o'clock. I pulled out my onion and saw that it was half-past eleven. Then, since my watch keeps perfect time, I declared that it was half-past eleven. No, I beg your pardon, but it's eleven o'clock, said Adolf. You can cut off my finger if it isn't half-past eleven, I cried, for I was sure of my watch. But the man of light looked at his watch and assured me that it was only eleven o'clock. My friend Adolf was right, and I was sorry for it, on account of my finger. I am an honourable man and an honest manufacturer. I have always kept my word, and no bill of mine has ever been dishonoured. I did not hesitate. Could I have done otherwise? Very well, I said to Adolf. I owe you a finger. And seizing a small stone tomahawk which lay on the desk of the man of light, and was evidently used as a paperweight, I raised it in the air and was bringing it down on the little finger of my left hand, which I had stuck well out on the corner of the desk. I had the right to give Adolf the little finger of my left hand, for I had only said to him you can cut off my finger without stipulating which finger, and I chose the finger the loss of which would inconvenience me the least. My little finger then would infallibly have been cut off, had not the man of light caught my wrist in a grip of steel and held it firmly. He bade me put down the tomahawk. I answered that I would not put down the tomahawk till I had cut off my finger, which belonged to Adolf. Adolf exclaimed that my finger was of no use to him and I could keep it. Marceline joined her entreaties to his and begged me to keep my finger, since Adolf made me a present of it. But I answered him that there was no reason for him to make me presents at this season of the year, and I answered her that she knew nothing at all about business. Then Monsieur Eliphras de la Equinox pointed out that I was not observing the conditions of the contract. I had said, you can cut off my finger. Consequently, it was the privilege of Adolf to cut off my finger. I admired this exact logic, which indeed never failed him, and I put down my tomahawk. I was wrong to put down my tomahawk in that house in Houchette Street, for they flung themselves upon me, and the man of light cried, Come on, it's too late! The only thing to do is to kill him. End of chapter 13